at being mothers and staying in the home. Of course, really, I think this is disingenuous. I would say that most women are good at being mothers and caring and looking after the home. It's a very, very small minority of women who function really well outside that environment. Not the other way around. There's a lot of problems with it, and she's admitting it. And then she mentions the collapse of marriage. She says that marriage would collapse to, it, collapse to its lowest ever levels here, meaning in England, in the West. Marriage has collapsed to its lowest levels. And why? What's the reason she gives? Because men are relieved of being providers. And they walk away from commitment. So when women are out working, the man doesn't have to provide. He doesn't have to commit. What's the purpose of marriage? We're equal partners. We both contribute equally. We both bring in the same amount of money. So the man doesn't feel he needs a commitment. To what? What is he committed to? So marriage is crumbling, partly because of this mentality that has been a byproduct of feminism, which these early feminist authors never predicted. And it, said, and it goes on to say, nor that getting pregnant could be as much of a problem as not getting pregnant for women who postponed motherhood. In other words, here's the other issue. Women want to have babies. It's in their biology. They're programmed to have babies. And if they don't start having babies, women start, women, they reach an age when they reach about 35. If they haven't had children, many, many women, if not most women, who reach that age without having children, they begin to suffer not only psychologically, but even physiologically, their body begins to suffer and their minds begin to suffer from that. Their body actually starts sending out chemicals and signals for them to get pregnant. And it gets something that actually begins to take over their mind and they suffer from it. And a lot of women are having problems. They're finding it hard to get pregnant. They're finding it hard to conceive, hard to build a partnership in which they can raise children because they've had a career of working and earning and so on and so forth. And this is a real problem. Another problem that was not predicted by these early feminist writers. And the other one, guess who does most of the part-time low-paid work? Guess who does most of the part-time low-paid work in the West? Women. Yeah, women. Despite all of this women's liberation, women are equal, until today in the West, women get paid less for the same jobs as men. They do the same jobs as men, they get paid less, they don't achieve high places in companies, and even those who do, they have to almost sacrifice their femininity. They have to start behaving like men in order to be able to achieve that type of level. But the fact is that most of the women who do work, their work is part-time and low-paid compared to men. So that's what she mentions. How these feminist authors fail to predict these things. And so when we look at Islam, when we look at Islam, my brothers and sisters, what do we see? We see a religion, guidance from the Creator, the one who created the man and who created the woman. The one who created us, Allah, knows us better than we know ourselves. He gave us guidance. He gave us a paradigm. He gave us a way for us to live. And that way for us to live includes how men and women should behave. And that is why the Quran tells us that men, men are the maintainers and protectors of women. That is the man's job, to be the maintainer 
and to be the protector of women. In fact, in a proper Islamic state, a proper Islamic society, I don't mean a country with Muslims in. Most of our countries are countries with Muslims inside. No, but a, a society that truly runs along Islamic values. If a woman does not have a husband or a father or uncles or brothers or male relatives to look after her and care for her, the state does not oblige her to go out and find work. The state takes the responsibility of being the maintainer and the protector of women. That's what would happen in a truly Islamic society. The emir takes that responsibility. So the woman has that right. It's her right to be able to stay at home. She should not be forced out. Not by the reality of her condition or by the propaganda of society to go and work. She shouldn't be pressured to do that. Rather, in reality, she should be helped and aided to contribute to society in the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has facilitated that for her. And what is that? How does Allah and how does Islam elevate? And it certainly does. Who could study the religion of Islam with an open heart? Who could study the religion of Islam and read what the Quran and read what the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says? about women in the position of the mother and fail to recognize the lofty and high status that Islam gives to women. You have heard the verses. You have heard the hadith. You have heard them again and again about how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the meaning of which reverence Allah and the wombs that bore you. How Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he puts reverencing himself and reverencing your mother together. And how could it not be when paradise, as we all know, lies at the feet of your mother, at, uh, from serving your mother and being kind to your mother and caring for your mother, and especially your mother, because your mother, you could never pay her back. The Prophet wasallam said, you can never pay your mother back ever for what she has done for you. Your father, if you found your father as a slave and you set him free, you bought him and set him free, you'd pay him back. But your mother, you can never pay her back. Never. And there's the famous story when a young man he comes to Omar ibn al-Khattab and he is carrying his mother on his back. He says, Ya Omar, I have carried my mother on my back for the whole of the Hajj. Did I pay her back now? He says to him, you did well, you did good. But young man, you didn't even pay her back for one tear she shed when she gave birth to you. And they say that Islam doesn't respect women? Is this subjugation? No, this is honor. This is dignity. This gives the woman honor and dignity when she does that thing which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created uniquely for her. Uniquely for her. She is the bearer of children. She is the one who carries that child. Month after month, Difficulty after difficulty, through hardship, and it doesn't only finish when that child is born. Then she feeds and cares for and nurtures that child. What she does for her child. That is the reason she is deserving of so much honor and respect. So when a man came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, who has the most right to my kindness? He ﷺ said, your mother. And he said, and after that, your mother. And after that, your mother. And after that, then your father. Your mother, your mother, your mother, then your father. Has the most right to your kindness. 
This is the status of the mother in Islam. But my dear brothers and sisters, I want the theme of my talk today, the end of it to be slightly different. It's not really going to be now a talk about how brilliant the position of women in Islam is compared to the position of women in the East and the West. We've heard that many times, alhamdulillah. But the question I want to ask, I want to ask you, my dear brothers and sisters sitting here today, I want to ask the sisters, I want you to ask yourself, are you fulfilling your roles? Are you fulfilling your obligations? Are you behaving the way that you should as Muslim women? Are you being the mothers that you should be? Are you being the daughters that you should be? Are you being the sisters that you should be? Are you being the wives that you should be? And oh Muslim men, are you treating women the way the Prophet وسلم, treated women? Are you treating your women as Muslims? Or are you treating them in another way? Here is my opportunity to reply to an Imam. A Bengali Imam, he happens to be Bengali, defending Indo-Pak culture. A sister writes to me, Abdul Rahim, she's a doctor. She's a qualified doctor. She's got married to a man in England. She's from Pakistan. He's a Muslim brought up in England, a, a, a Pakistani Muslim, but living in England. So she comes to live with him and of course his parents. Now, the poor lady is having the most terrible time because not only does she have to look after her husband, of course she has to serve her in-laws. And she asks me and writes to me about her situation. So here's some revolutionary stuff for you brothers. You're not going to like this, I'm sorry to say. I told her, it's not your obligation to look after your in-laws. Your obligation in Islam is to look after your husband. It's your husband's job to look after his mum and dad, not your job. Your job is to look after your husband and your children. If, if you look after his parents and it's a good thing for you to do, then that is sadaqa from you and kindness from you to help your husband fulfill his duty. Her husband, this is her husband. She is pregnant with morning sickness. Yet this man wakes her up, even though she's very tired, very sick, and wakes her up so she has to make a cup of tea for his parents. He could do it himself, but he doesn't. He has to wake his wife up to do it. Well, I said, that's disgraceful. I said, that's disgraceful. What sort of behavior is that? What sort of husband is that? What sort of man is that? Well, I tell you what, it's a good Indo-Pak man. And a good Indo-Pak wife according to this Bengali Imam, wouldn't even dream of asking Abdurrahim Green questions like that. She would go and do this without even a thought. Subhanallah. Anyway, the difference is, Alhamdulillah, my religion is Islam. My deen is Islam. My prophet is Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
I don't follow Indo-Pak culture or any other culture. I follow what has been taught by Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So here's my answer to the Imam. I hope you see it on TV. There is a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You can verify it. It's a well-known hadith and I'm sure it's authentic. Do you know the hadith about the three men who are traveling and it begins to rain and they seek shelter in a cave? Do you know that hadith? And the rocks fall down and the block the entrance to the cave? You all know the hadith, just about everyone's shaking their head. So I'm not going to go through the whole hadith, but I'm going to remind you of one relevant aspect to this hadith. Here is the relevant aspects. One of them, he says, Oh Allah, I used to go and work in the fields and it was my habit every evening to give my parents a glass of milk before they went to sleep. And one day I was delayed in my working in the fields and I came back and I found that my parents were sleeping. And so I waited by their bedside until they woke up. Even though my wife and children were crying out of hunger, I waited beside their bedside until they woke up so I could give them the milk to drink. Let's, let's now give the Indo-Pak version of this hadith. I came back from the fields. Every day I tell my wife, go and give my parents some milk. One day I come back late, I sit down on the bed. Oh, I'm very tired. Oh, but their parents are sleeping. No, you stay there by the bed until they wake up. And when they wake up, you give them a glass of milk. No. Paradise, brothers, lies at the feet of your mothers. You, you under your mother's feet. Not your wife under your mother's feet. You under your mother's feet. You serve your parents. That's your job. If your wife helps you, if your wife helps you, alhamdulillah, you should thank her. My dear wife, thank you for helping me to look after my parents. Thank you for doing that. Appreciate her. Love her more. Be grateful to Allah that he gave you a wife like that. And I encourage all the sisters. I'm not discouraging you sisters from helping your husbands. No way. I am not discouraging you. But what I can't stand is this ignorance. This, this ignorance that people push. These are the same people. I know a lot of you are from South India. And I know because I went to Cochin myself and the brothers there were helping organize this. I remember they told me before their organization came along, the imams there, the so-called imams there, forbade women from learning the Quran. They forbade women from learning the Quran. Why? Because it's a waste of time. Women shouldn't learn deen. Women shouldn't learn Quran. This is their... Well, that's you have your indo pak version of how women are supposed to be. Well, alhamdulillah, these also indo pak brothers, mashallah, Allahu Akbar, and sisters, changed that part of society. They helped change it. Their group and organization helped change it. And because of that, by the way, because of what they did, at least in part because of what they did, South India is amongst the most educated populations, not only in India, but in the world. Because you know why? When you educate a woman, you educate all the children. She's the first school. She is the first school. You educate her, she educates the children. You educate a man, what does he do? He goes to work, he, this, he doesn't have time when he comes back to teach the kids. This is why, of course, Educating the women is so important, but sisters, I want to ask you, especially some of us living here in this very nice, luxurious land. I wonder how many of you are really mothers. Are you the mother or is the maid the mother? Are you the mother? Do you care for the children? Do you nurture them, care for them, feed them? 
look after them. When they're ill, you take care of them. Are you the one who educates them or is it as soon as you possibly can, you send them off somewhere to be educated by someone else? What does being a mother mean? What does being a true Muslim mother mean? That's something I wanted you to think about. And what does being a true Muslim wife mean, my sisters? What does it mean? Are you really the wives that you should be? Supporting your husbands the way that you should? Giving them the support that you should? Obeying them? Beautifying yourself for them so when they come home from this fitna, this place of fitna and this land of fitna, they, mashallah, alhamdulillah, I've come back to my beautiful wife and my beautiful home. And he forgets all his worries and he forgets all his woes. That's how a good wife should be. The best women are the ones who when you look at them, you are pleased. And when you ask them to do something, they do it. My sisters, I ask you, daughters, are you the daughters you should be to your fathers, to your mothers? Or are you like those people the Prophet wasallam said would come at the end of days? And maybe this hadith has this meaning, maybe it doesn't. It's one of the signs of Qiyamah that a woman would give birth to her master. That maybe this means the children will treat their parents as slaves. Do you treat your mother and father like that? as if they are your servants, as if they are your slaves. No, my Muslim sisters, be a servant to your mother, be a servant to your father. And all of you, you must encourage each other and help each other to obey Allah, to worship Allah, to follow the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. Brothers and sisters, it's been a very hard talk. It's been a very tough talk. I have to finish with a joke. I have to finish with this joke. I won't finish, I have to make a comment about it. I heard this just the other day. This man, he comes to his wife crying. <laughs> he's crying and he's crying and his wife says, what's wrong? He said, the Emir just made a new law. And he said that unless all the men get married to two or three or four wives, he will chop our heads off. She says, MashaAllah, Alhamdulillah, why are you crying? That's good. You'll die shaheed. <laughs> and uh, I think I was laughing for about 10 minutes after I heard that. The <laughs> you know, the point being, brothers, I, I'm honestly not encouraging all the brothers to go and get second wives but it is a piece of advice to all of us yeah let's not try to make islam the way we want it let's not try to make islam the way we want it allah has given us beautiful guidance you know our problems come as muslims individually and collectively, as men and as women, when we don't follow that guidance from Allah, not only we don't follow it, brothers and sisters, we have to love it. We have to love this deen. Not everything that just, not the bits that suit us, not the bits that sound nice to us. Oh yes, I like that bit in Islam that says, paradise lies at the feet of the mother. But I don't like that bit that says this and that. No, brothers and sisters, we have to love all of it. Because it's guidance from Allah. And it's good for us whether we know it or not. So I ask Allah, I plead with Allah, I beg with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to guide us all upon the footsteps of our beloved messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That we take from our hearts our false desires and fill our hearts with the love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the love for his deen. I also make dua that our brothers in Islam that you become the best of men. Do you want to know how to become the best of men? By being the best husbands. The best of you are those who are best to their wives. And who is the best to their wives? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. 
and he used to help in the home. He used to help his wives. He used to, he used to help out in the home. Subhanallah, that's how he was. When he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came back from fighting, from teaching, from governing, he would serve his family. He would serve his family. Not get his family to serve him. That's how Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was. That's his sunnah, my dear brothers. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if a woman performs her prayers, gives zakah and fasts, the obligatory fast, does the pillars of Islam and obeys her husband, Allah will say to her on the day of judgment, enter paradise by whichever gate you please. And I don't know of a hadith that has the equivalent for men. So sisters, I encourage all of us, my brothers and sisters, to be upon the obedience of Allah. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We're opening now for a question answer session. We shall have the first question from the mic on my left. But before that, if there are any non-Muslim guests, we would like to give them first preference due to the very limited time we have. Do we have any non-Muslim guests at the microphones for the question? Mic number two. Yes, please. Your name and your occupation before you pose your question. Uh, good evening, Mr. Uh, Greens. My name is Ryan. Uh, I'm in Dubai for six years. I would like to ask you whether the Muslims, the one who are in Islam, are allowed to marry the non-Muslims. Uh, the men and the women, are they allowed to marry the non-Muslims? Um, a Muslim man is allowed to marry a woman from the people of the book, meaning the Jews and the Christians, who is chaste. Meaning she is not someone who has taken boyfriends and so on and so forth. So a Muslim man is allowed to marry a woman from the people of the book who is chaste. To tell you the truth, however, many scholars in Islam did not really encourage this, even though it is allowed. And there's no doubt that it has been allowed, but they discouraged it for many, many different reasons. So basically the answer to that, except for this, uh, this exception that we have mentioned, then a Muslim, except for this exception we mentioned, a Muslim should marry a Muslim. And it's not considered to be marriage in Islam. If the, if the two people who are getting married are not Muslim, it's not considered to be marriage. It's not valid as a marriage contract in the Islamic uh, viewpoint, uh, unless for the exception that I mentioned. So basically my answer to you is no, it's not allowed for a Muslim to marry a non-Muslim, except for a man to the Ahl al-Kitab, women who are chaste. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Thank you very exactly. much. Any Sister, a non-Muslim sister on the mic. Coming back. Yes, please. Just, please. <laughs> sir, I'm a non-Muslim. Yes. But I just want to know, like, uh, I'm Sanu. Yes, Sanu. And uh, I just want to know, what does Islam say about polygamy? About polygamy? Yeah. In Islam, a man is allowed to marry up to four wives under the condition that he treats all of his wives equally in terms of the time he spends with them and the gifts and the way that he provides for them. Yeah? So he should be equal with them in terms of the time that he spends with them and the gifts that he gives with them. If he is not able to treat them justly, then Allah says in the Quran, then marry only one. So, if you, it is allowed to marry up to four at one time, if you can fulfill those conditions. If you can't fulfill those conditions, then God has warned us that we should be far from doing injustice and that we should marry only one wife. Um, so, just, so I just want to add on to it. I want to know like, yeah. 
why was that given us four? Like in my religion, it said that for a man there should be only one pair. Yes. So why was that? I believe that it should have been extended to four. Oh, mm. just want to know that. My my real answer to you, my friend, honestly, is that the question you're answering are asking, in a sense, is not the important question, right? The important question is, is the Quran from God? Is Muhammad the prophet of God? If we believe the Quran is from God and we believe that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, God's peace and blessings be upon him, is the prophet of God. Would you agree with me from the point of view of logic, just from logic, that if the Quran is from God, from the creator of everything, then whatever God tells us to do, we should do it and we should accept it. Can you accept the logic of that? Yes. Yes? So surely the most important question is not why this and why that. And because we could come up with maybe a hundred reasons, it may satisfy you, it may not satisfy you. The real, and I actually recommend if you want to hear some reasoned explanations, ask the same question to Dr. Zaki Naik when he comes up. Yeah? Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. I, I honestly, I could give you, I could give you his reasons, but I won't do it nearly as beautifully as he does it. Okay? Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Thank you, sir. Thank you. But, but, but my friend, the thing that I would really ask you to do yeah, is to discuss the issue and think about the issue. And I'd be more than happy to discuss with this, the important issue for me and you to discuss, is the Quran from God or not? If you accept it's from God, yeah, then you must accept whatever the Quran says. What, have you read the Quran? No. You haven't read the Quran? Okay. If, you, if we have time, we'll discuss afterwards, inshallah. Thank you very much for your question. And put the question again to Dr. Zakir when he comes, and he'll give you a fantastic answer, inshallah. Inshallah. Next question from mic number two, from the brother's side. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum as Abdurrahim Grim, I love you for the sake of Allah. May he for whose sake you love me, love you too. And uh, we would like to welcome yani, our uh, new Muslim. Muslima who entered Islam and we will tell her Definitely, that this is the way of salvation and the, and the way of prosperity and inshallah may Allah give her strength in, her, Ameen. Ameen. in her heart. Ameen. 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 Uh, Akhi Abdurrahim Grim, yes. I, I am raising up this issue because it is important. It has been raised up and I need your clarification. Okay. Uh, the, the issue of jihad in Islam, there are two types of jihad. There is jihad dafi' and there is jihad talab and this is mentioned in the Quran. This is mentioned in the Quran, so would you please clarify that? Okay, could you um, jihad what did you say? Jihad u dafa' and jihad u talab. There is jihad of attack and jihad of defense. Yes. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in the Quran. Yes. So can you please clarify that and yani, tell us about it? I could. But uh, okay. Um, certainly, uh, any society, any society, including, by the way, of course, the United Nations, accepts the basic principle that any nation has the right to defend itself from attack. This is enshrined in the Universal Charter of Human Rights. It's enshrined in the United Nations that if one nation is attacked, then the other nation has the right to defend itself. And this is not controversial at all. And of course, this is uh, what you might be referring to here as what is known as defensive jihad. So how about this concept of offensive jihad? Then this is a, I have to say, a very big discussion, which I don't think it's uh, the time or the place to go into this discussion right now, because it is a very big discussion and involves uh, some, uh, you know, complex issues that surround it. First of all, we can definitely, as I said, accept the first type of jihad. As for what is the offensive jihad, it is definitely existed in Islam, in the history of Islam to some extent. Uh, were there some particular conditions that surrounded that? 
how relevant is that in our world today? Really, my brother, this deserves a lecture in and of itself. Uh, and it, I couldn't possibly do this topic justice in a short question and answer session. But you know what? Why don't you ask Dr. Zakir Naik? I'm sure he has a really good answer for that. <laughs> Uh, yes. yani we would be waiting for that lecture. Jazakallah khair. Inshallah, I'll be more than happy. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa la alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa sallam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khair. Shah Abdurrahim Green for that very enlightening talk. Are you treating your women as Muslims? Or are you treating them in another way? When women are out working, 